chapter 2. The sower went forth to sow. Based on Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 to 23, Mark 4, verses 1 through 20, and Luke 8, verses 4 through 15. The Sower and the Seed By the parable of the sower, Christ illustrates the things of the kingdom of heaven and the work of the great husbandman for his people. Like a sower in the field, he came to scatter the heavenly grain of truth, and his parable teaching itself was the seed with which the most precious truths of his grace were sown. Because of its simplicity, the parable of the sower has not been valued as it should be. For the natural seed cast into the soil, Christ desires to lead our minds to the gospel seed, the sowing of which results in bringing man back to his loyalty to God. He who gave the parable of the tiny seed is the sovereign of heaven, and the same laws that govern earthly seed sowing govern the sowing of the seeds of truth. By the Sea of Galilee, a company had gathered to see and hear Jesus, an eager expectant throng. The sick were there, lying on their mats, waiting to present their cases before him. It was Christ's God-given right to heal the woes of a sinful race, and he now rebuked disease and diffused around him life and health and peace. As the crowd continued to increase, the people pressed close about Christ until there was no room to receive them. Then, speaking a word to the men in their fishing boats, he stepped into the boat that was waiting to take him across the lake, and, bidding his disciples push off a little from the land, he spoke to the multitude upon the shore. Beside the sea lay the beautiful plain of Gennesaret. Beyond rose the hills, and upon hillside and plain both sowers and reapers were busy, the one casting seed and the other harvesting the early grain. Looking upon the scene, Christ said, Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Christ's mission was not understood by the people of his time. The manner of his coming was not in accordance with their expectations. The Lord Jesus was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Its imposing services were of divine appointment. They were designed to teach the people that at the time appointed one would come to whom those ceremonies pointed. But the Jews had exalted the forms and ceremonies and had lost sight of their object. The traditions, maxims, and enactments of men hid from them the lessons which God intended to convey. These maxims and traditions became an obstacle to their understanding and practice of true religion. And when the reality came in the person of Christ, they did not recognize in him the fulfillment of all their types, the substance of all their shadows. They rejected the antitype and clung to their types and useless ceremonies. The Son of God had come, but they continued to ask for a sign. The message, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they answered by demands for a miracle. Matthew 3, verse 2. The gospel of Christ was a stumbling block to them because they demanded signs instead of a Savior. They expected the Messiah to prove his claims by mighty deeds of conquest, to establish his empire on the ruins of earthly kingdoms. This expectation Christ answered in the parable of the sower, not by force of arms, not by violent interpositions was the kingdom of God to prevail, but by the implanting of a new principle in the hearts of men. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, Matthew 13:37. Christ had come not as a king, but as a sower not for the overthrow of kingdoms, but for the scattering of seed, not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness, 
but to a harvest to be gathered after patient toil and through losses and disappointments. The Pharisees perceived the meaning of Christ's parable, but to them its lesson was unwelcome. They affected not to understand it. To the multitude it involved in still greater mystery the purpose of the new teacher, whose words had so strangely moved their hearts and so bitterly disappointed their ambitions. The disciples themselves had not understood the parable, but their interest was awakened. They came to Jesus privately and asked for an explanation. This was the desire which Christ wished to arouse, that he might give them more definite instruction. He explained the parable to them, as he will make plain his word to all who seek him in sincerity of heart. Those who study the word of God with hearts open to the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit will not remain in darkness as to the meaning of the word. If any man willeth to do his will, Christ said, he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God or whether I speak from myself. John seven seventeen, the Revised Version. All who come to Christ for a clearer knowledge of the truth will receive it. He will unfold to them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and these mysteries will be understood by the heart that longs to know the truth. The heavenly light will shine into the soul temple and will be revealed to others as the bright shining of a lamp on a dark path. The sower went forth to sow. In the east, the state of affairs was so unsettled and there was so great danger from violence that the people dwelt chiefly in walled towns, and the husbandmen went forth daily to their labor outside the walls. So Christ, the heavenly sower, went forth to sow. He left his home of security and peace, left the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, left his position upon the throne of the universe. He went forth, a suffering, tempted man, went forth in solitude to sow in tears, to water with his blood the seed of life for a world lost. His servants, in like manner, must go forth to sow. When called to become a sower of the seed of truth, Abraham was bidden, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Genesis 12, verse 1. And he went out, not knowing whither he went, Hebrews 11.8. So to the Apostle Paul, praying in the temple at Jerusalem, came the message from God, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Acts 22.21. So, those who are called to unite with Christ must leave all in order to follow him. Old associations must be broken up, plans of life relinquished, earthly hopes surrendered in toil and tears, in solitude and through sacrifice, must the seed be sown. The sower soweth the word. Christ came to sow the world with truth. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been sowing the seeds of error. It was by a lie that he first gained control over men, and thus he still works to overthrow God's kingdom in the earth and to bring men under his power. A sower from a higher world, Christ came to sow the seeds of truth. He who had stood in the counsels of God, who had dwelt in the innermost sanctuary of the eternal, could bring to men the pure principles of truth. Ever since the fall of man, Christ had been the revealer of truth to the world. By him the incorruptible seed, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever, is communicated to men. 1 Peter 1.23 in that first promise spoken to our fallen race in Eden, Christ was sowing the gospel seed. But it is to his personal ministry among men and to the work which he thus established that the parable of the sower especially applies. The word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating principle. In it, the life of the plant is enfolded. So there is life in God's word. Christ says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6:63. 6, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. John 5:24. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, 
the very life of God, by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. Every seed brings forth fruit after its kind. Sow the seed under right conditions, and it will develop its own life in the plant. Receive into the soul by faith the incorruptible seed of the word, and it will bring forth a character and a life after the similitude of the character and life of God. The teachers of Israel were not sowing the seed of the word of God. Christ's work as a teacher of truth was in marked contrast to that of the rabbis of his time. They dwelt upon traditions, upon human theories and speculations. Often that which man had taught and written about the word, they put in place of the word itself. Their teaching had no power to quicken the soul. The subject of Christ's teaching and preaching was the word of God. He met questioners with the plain, It is written, What saith the Scriptures? How readest thou? At every opportunity, when an interest was awakened by either friend or foe, he sowed the seed of the word. He who is the way, the truth, and the life, himself the living word, points to the scriptures, saying, They are they which testify of me. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he opened to his disciples in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. John 5.39 and Luke 24.27 Christ's servants are to do the same work. In our day, as of old, the vital truths of God's Word are set aside for human theories and speculations. Many professed ministers of the gospel do not accept the whole Bible as the inspired Word. One wise man rejects one portion, another questions another part. They set up their judgment as superior to the Word, and the Scripture which they do teach rests upon their own authority. Its divine authenticity is destroyed. Thus, the seeds of infidelity are sown broadcast, for the people become confused and know not what to believe. There are many beliefs that the mind has no right to entertain. In the days of Christ, the rabbis put a forced, mystical construction upon many portions of Scripture. Because the plain teaching of God's Word condemned their practices, they tried to destroy its force. The same thing is done today. The Word of God is made to appear mysterious and obscure in order to excuse transgression of His law. Christ rebuked these practices in His day. He taught that the Word of God was to be understood by all. He pointed to the Scriptures as of unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the Word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. The Bible has been robbed of its power, and the results are seen in a lowering of the tone of spiritual life. In the sermons from many pulpits of today, there is not that divine manifestation which awakens the conscience and brings life to the soul. The hearers cannot say, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Luke 24:32. There are many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart. The assertions and inventions of men are of no value. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him whose word can renew the soul into everlasting life. Christ's favorite theme was the paternal tenderness and abundant grace of God. He dwelt much upon the holiness of his character and his law. He presented himself to the people as the way, the truth, and the life. Let these be the themes of Christ's ministers. Present the truth as it is in Jesus. Make plain the requirements of the law and the gospel. Tell the people of Christ's life of self-denial and sacrifice, of his humiliation and death, of his resurrection and ascension, of his intercession for them in the courts of God, of his promise, I will come again and receive you unto myself, John 14, 3. Instead of discussing erroneous theories or seeking to combat the opponents of the gospel, follow the example of Christ. Let fresh truths from God's treasure house flash into life. Preach the word. 
so beside all waters, be instant in season, out of season. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Every word of God is pure. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Second Timothy 4.2, Isaiah 32.20, Jeremiah 23.28, and Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The sower soweth the word. Here is presented the great principle which should underlie all educational work. The seed is the word of God. But in too many schools of our day, God's word is set aside. Other subjects occupy the mind. The study of infidel authors holds a large place in the educational system. Skeptical sentiments are interwoven in the matter placed in school books. Scientific research becomes misleading because its discoveries are misinterpreted and perverted. The Word of God is compared with the supposed teachings of science and is made to appear uncertain and untrustworthy. Thus, the seeds of doubt are planted in the minds of the youth, and in time of temptation they spring up. When faith in God's word is lost, the soul has no guide, no safeguard. The youth are drawn into paths which lead away from God and from everlasting life. To this cause may in great degree be attributed the widespread iniquity in our world today. When the word of God is set aside, its power to restrain the evil passions of the natural heart is rejected. Men sow to the flesh, and of the flesh they reap corruption. And here, too, is the great cause of mental weakness and inefficiency. In turning from God's word to feed on the writings of uninspired men, the mind becomes dwarfed and cheapened. It is not brought in contact with deep, broad principles of eternal truth. The understanding adapts itself to the comprehension of the things with which it is familiar, and in this devotion to finite things it is weakened, its power is contracted, and after a time it becomes unable to expand. All this is false education. The work of every teacher should be to fasten the mind of the youth upon the grand truths of the word of inspiration. This is the education essential for this life and for the life to come. And let it not be thought that this will prevent the study of the sciences or cause a lower standard in education. The knowledge of God is as high as heaven and as broad as the universe. There is nothing so ennobling and invigorating as a study of the great themes which concern our eternal life. Let the youth seek to grasp these God-given truths, and their minds will expand and grow strong in the effort. It will bring every student who is a doer of the word into a broader field of thought and secure for him a wealth of knowledge that is imperishable. The education to be secured by searching the scriptures is an experimental knowledge of the plan of salvation. Such an education will restore the image of God in the soul. It will strengthen and fortify the mind against temptation and fit the learner to become a co-worker with Christ in his mission of mercy to the world. It will make him a member of the heavenly family and prepare him to share the inheritance of the saints in light. But the teacher of sacred truth can impart only that which he himself knows by experience. The sower sowed his seed. Christ taught the truth because he was the truth. His own thought, his character, his life experience were embodied in his teaching. So with his servants. Those who would teach the word are to make it their own by a personal experience. They must know what it is to have Christ made unto them wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In presenting the word of God to others, they are not to make it a suppose so or a maybe. They should declare with the Apostle Peter, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Second Peter 1.16 Every minister of Christ and every teacher should be able to say with the beloved John, The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. 1 John 1, verse 2. The Soil by the Wayside 
That with which the parable of the sower chiefly deals is the effect produced on the growth of the seed by the soil into which it is cast. By this parable, Christ was virtually saying to his hearers, It is not safe for you to stand as critics of my work or to indulge disappointment because it does not meet your ideas. The question of greatest importance to you is, How do you treat my message? Upon your reception or rejection of it, your eternal destiny depends. Explaining the seed that fell by the wayside, he said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. The seed sown by the wayside represents the word of God as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer. Like the hard, beaten path, trodden down by the feet of men and beasts, is the heart that becomes a highway for the world's traffic, its pleasures, and sins. Absorbed in selfish aims and sinful indulgences, the soul is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13 The spiritual faculties are paralyzed. Men hear the word but understand it not. They do not discern that it applies to themselves. They do not realize their need or their danger. They do not perceive the love of Christ, and they pass by the message of His grace as something that does not concern them. As the birds are ready to catch up the seed from the wayside, so Satan is ready to catch away the seeds of divine truth from the soul. He fears that the word of God may awaken the careless and take effect upon the hardened heart. Satan and his angels are in the assemblies where the gospel is preached. While angels of heaven endeavor to impress hearts with the word of God, the enemy is on the alert to make the word of no effect. With an earnestness equaled only by his malice, he tries to thwart the work of the Spirit of God. While Christ is drawing the soul by his love, Satan tries to turn away the attention of the one who is moved to seek the Savior. He engages the mind with worldly schemes. He excites criticism or insinuates doubt and unbelief. The speaker's choice of language or his manner may not please the hearers, and they dwell upon these defects. Thus the truth they need, and which God has graciously sent them, makes no lasting impression. Satan has many helpers. Many who profess to be Christians are aiding the tempter to catch away the seeds of truth from other hearts. Many who listen to the preaching of the Word of God make it the subject of criticism at home. They sit in judgment on the sermon as they would on the words of a lecturer or a political speaker. The message that should be regarded as the word of the Lord to them is dwelt upon with trifling or sarcastic comment. The minister's character, motives, and actions, and the conduct of fellow members of the church are freely discussed. Severe judgment is pronounced, gossip or slander repeated, and this in the hearing of the unconverted. Often these things are spoken by parents in the hearing of their own children. Thus are destroyed respect for God's messengers and reverence for their message, and many are taught to regard lightly God's word itself. Thus in the homes of professed Christians many youth are educated to be infidels, and the parents question why their children are so little interested in the gospel and so ready to doubt the truth of the Bible. They wonder that it is so difficult to reach them with moral and religious influences. They do not see that their own example has hardened the hearts of their children. The good seed finds no place to take root, and Satan catches it away. In Stony Places He that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. The seed sown upon stony ground finds little depth of soil. The plant springs up quickly, but the root cannot penetrate the rock to find nutriment to sustain its growth, and it soon perishes. Many who make a profession of religion are stony ground hearers. Like the rock underlying the layer of earth, 
The selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil of their good desires and aspirations. The love of self is not subdued. They have not seen the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and the heart has not been humbled under a sense of its guilt. This class may be easily convinced and appear to be bright converts, but they have only a superficial religion. It is not because men receive the word immediately, nor because they rejoice in it, that they fall away. As soon as Matthew heard the Savior's call, immediately he rose up, left all, and followed him. As soon as the divine word comes to our hearts, God desires us to receive it, and it is right to accept it with joy. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, Luke 15, verse 7. And there is joy in the soul that believes on Christ. But those who in the parable are said to receive the word immediately do not count the cost. They do not consider what the word of God requires of them. They do not bring it face to face with all their habits of life and yield themselves fully to its control. The roots of the plant strike down deep into the soil and hidden from sight nourish the life of the plant. So, with the Christian, it is by the invisible union of the soul with Christ through faith that the spiritual life is nourished. But the stony ground hearers depend upon self instead of Christ. They trust in their good works and good impulses, and are strong in their own righteousness. They are not strong in the Lord, and in the power of his might. Such a one hath not root in himself, for he is not connected with Christ. The hot summer sun that strengthens and ripens the hardy grain destroys that which has no depth of root. So he who hath not root in himself dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Many receive the gospel as a way of escape from suffering, rather than as a deliverance from sin. They rejoice for a season, for they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial. While life moves slowly with them, they may appear to be consistent Christians, but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear reproach for Christ's sake. When the Word of God points out some cherished sin or requires self-denial or sacrifice, they are offended. It would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their life. They look at the present inconvenience and trial and forget the eternal realities. Like the disciples who left Jesus, they are ready to say, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? John 6, verse 60. There are very many who claim to serve God, but who have no experimental knowledge of Him. Their desire to do His will is based upon their own inclination, not upon the deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. Their conduct is not brought into harmony with the law of God. They profess to accept Christ as their Savior, but they do not believe that He will give them power to overcome their sins. They have not a personal relation with a living Savior and their characters reveal defects both hereditary and cultivated. It is one thing to assent in a general way to the agency of the Holy Spirit, and another thing to accept His work as a reprover calling to repentance. Many feel a sense of estrangement from God, a realization of their bondage to self and sin. They make efforts to reform, but they do not crucify self. They do not give themselves entirely to the hands of Christ, seeking for divine power to do His will. They are not willing to be molded after the divine similitude. In a general way, they acknowledge their imperfections, but they do not give up their particular sins. With each wrong act, the old selfish nature is gaining strength. The only hope for these souls is to realize in themselves the truth of Christ's words to Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, verses 7 and 3. True holiness is wholeness in the service of God. This is the condition of true Christian living. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration, for undivided service. He demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength, 
self is not to be cherished. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. Love must be the principle of action. Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. And love will be revealed in sacrifice. The plan of redemption was laid in sacrifice, a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable. Christ gave all for us, and those who receive Christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their Redeemer. The thought of His honor and glory will come before anything else. If we love Jesus, we shall love to live for Him, to present our thank offerings to Him, to labor for Him. The very labor will be light. For His sake we shall covet pain and toil and sacrifice. We shall sympathize with His longing for the salvation of men. We shall feel the same tender craving for souls that He has felt. This is the religion of Christ. Anything short of it is a deception. No mere theory of truth or profession of discipleship will save any soul. We do not belong to Christ unless we are His holy. It is by half-heartedness in the Christian life that men become feeble in purpose and changeable in desire. The effort to serve both self and Christ makes one a stony ground hearer, and he will not endure when the test comes upon him. Among Thorns He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. The gospel seed often falls among thorns and noxious weeds, and if there is not a moral transformation in the human heart, if old habits and practices in the former life of sin are not left behind, if the attributes of Satan are not expelled from the soul, the wheat crop will be choked. The thorns will come to be the crop and will kill out the wheat. Grace can thrive only in the heart that is being constantly prepared for the precious seeds of truth. The thorns of sin will grow in any soil. They need no cultivation. But grace must be carefully cultivated. The briars and thorns are always ready to spring up, and the work of purification must advance continually. If the heart is not kept under the control of God, if the Holy Spirit does not work unceasingly to refine and ennoble the character, the old habits will reveal themselves in the life. Men may profess to believe the gospel, but unless they are sanctified by the gospel, their profession is of no avail. If they do not gain the victory over sin, then sin is gaining the victory over them. The thorns that have been cut off but not uprooted grow apace until the soul is overspread with them. Christ specified the things that are dangerous to the soul. As recorded by Mark, he mentions the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. Luke specifies the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. These are what choke the word, the growing spiritual seed. The soul ceases to draw nourishment from Christ, and spirituality dies out of the heart. The Cares of This World No class is free from the temptation to worldly care. To the poor, toil and deprivation and the fear of want bring perplexities and burdens. To the rich come fear of loss and a multitude of anxious cares. Many of Christ's followers forget the lesson he has bidden us learn from the flowers of the field. They do not trust to his constant care. Christ cannot carry their burden, because they do not cast it upon him. Therefore the cares of this life, which should drive them to the Savior for help and comfort, separate them from him. Many who might be fruitful in God's service become bent on acquiring wealth. Their whole energy is absorbed in business enterprises, and they feel obliged to neglect things of a spiritual nature. Thus they separate themselves from God. We are enjoined in the Scriptures to be not slothful in business, Romans 12:11. We are to labor that we may impart to him who needs. Christians must work, 
they must engage in business, and they can do this without committing sin. But many become so absorbed in business that they have no time for prayer, no time for the study of the Bible, no time to seek and serve God. At times the longings of the soul go out for holiness and heaven, but there is no time to turn aside from the din of the world to listen to the majestic and authoritative utterances of the Spirit of God. The things of eternity are made subordinate, the things of the world supreme. It is impossible for the seed of the word to bring forth fruit, for the life of the soul is given to nourish the thorns of worldliness. And many, who are working with a very different purpose, fall into a like error. They are working for others' good. Their duties are pressing, their responsibilities are many, and they allow their labor to crowd out devotion. Communion with God through prayer and a study of His Word is neglected. They forget that Christ has said, Without me ye can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. They walk apart from Christ. Their life is not pervaded by His grace, and the characteristics of self are revealed. Their service is marred by desire for supremacy and the harsh and lovely traits of the unsubdued heart. Here is one of the chief secrets of failure in Christian work. This is why its results are often so meager. The Deceitfulness of Riches The love of riches has an infatuating deceptive power. Too often, those who possess worldly treasure forget that it is God who gives them power to get wealth. They say, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Deuteronomy 8.17 Their riches, instead of awakening gratitude to God, lead to the exaltation of self. They lose the sense of their dependence upon God and their obligation to their fellow men. Instead of regarding wealth as a talent to be employed for the glory of God and the uplifting of humanity, they look upon it as a means of serving themselves. Instead of developing in man the attributes of God, riches thus used are developing in him the attributes of Satan. The seed of the word is choked with thorns. And Pleasures of This Life there is danger in amusement that is sought merely for self-gratification. All habits of indulgence that weaken the physical powers, that becloud the mind, or that benumb the spiritual perceptions, are fleshly lusts which war against the soul. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. And the lusts of other things. These are not necessarily things sinful in themselves, but something that is made first instead of the kingdom of God. Whatever attracts the mind from God, whatever draws the affections away from Christ, is an enemy to the soul. When the mind is youthful and vigorous and susceptible of rapid development, there is great temptation to be ambitious for self, to serve self. If worldly schemes are successful, there is an inclination to continue in a line that deadens conscience and prevents a correct estimate as to what constitutes real excellence of character. When circumstances favor this development, growth will be seen in a direction prohibited by the Word of God. In this formative period of their children's life, the responsibility of parents is very great. It should be their study to surround the youth with right influences, influences that will give them correct views of life and its true success. Instead of this, how many parents make it their first object to secure for their children worldly prosperity? All their associations are chosen with reference to this object. Many parents make their home in some large city and introduce their children into fashionable society. They surround them with influences that encourage worldliness and pride. In this atmosphere, the mind and soul are dwarfed. The high and noble aims of life are lost sight of. The privilege of being sons of God, heirs of eternity, is bartered for worldly gain. Many parents seek to promote the happiness of their children by gratifying their love of amusement. They allow them to engage in sports and to attend parties of pleasure and provide them with money to use freely and display in self-gratification. The more the desire for pleasure is indulged, the stronger it becomes. 
The interest of these youth is more and more absorbed in amusement until they come to look upon it as the great object of life. They form habits of idleness and self-indulgence that make it almost impossible for them ever to become steadfast Christians. Even the church, which should be the pillar and ground of the truth, is found encouraging the selfish love of pleasure. When money is to be raised for religious purposes, to what means do many churches resort? To bazaars, suppers, fancy fairs, even to lotteries and like devices. Often the place set apart for God's worship is desecrated by feasting and drinking, buying, selling, and merrymaking. Respect for the house of God and reverence for His worship are lessened in the minds of the youth. The barriers of self-restraint are weakened. Selfishness, appetite, the love of display are appealed to, and they strengthen as they are indulged. The pursuit of pleasure and amusement centers in the cities. Many parents who choose a city home for their children, thinking to give them greater advantages, meet with disappointment and too late repent of their terrible mistake. The cities of today are fast becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. The many holidays encourage idleness, the exciting sports, theater going, horse racing, gambling, liquor drinking, and reveling stimulate every passion to intense activity. The youth are swept away by the popular current. Those who learn to love amusement for its own sake open the door to a flood of temptations. They give themselves up to social gaiety and thoughtless mirth, and their intercourse with pleasure lovers has an intoxicating effect upon the mind. They are led on from one form of dissipation to another until they lose both the desire and the capacity for a life of usefulness. Their religious aspirations are chilled. Their spiritual life is darkened. All the nobler faculties of the soul, all that link man with the spiritual world, are debased. It is true that some may see their folly and repent. God may pardon them, but they have wounded their own souls and brought upon themselves a lifelong peril. The power of discernment, which ought ever to be kept keen and sensitive to distinguish between right and wrong, is in a great measure destroyed. They are not quick to recognize the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit or to discern the devices of Satan. Too often in time of danger they fall under temptation and are led away from God. The end of their pleasure-loving life is ruin for this world and for the world to come. Cares, riches, pleasures, all are used by Satan in playing the game of life for the human soul. The warning is given, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John two fifteen and 16 He who reads the hearts of men as an open book says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. Luke 21.34 And the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit writes, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10 Preparation of the Soil Throughout the parable of the sower, Christ represents the different results of the sowing as depending upon the soil. In every case, the sower and the seed are the same. Thus, he teaches that if the word of God fails of accomplishing its work in our hearts and lives, the reason is to be found in ourselves. But the result is not beyond our control. True, we cannot change ourselves, but the power of choice is ours, and it rests with us to determine what we will become. The wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground hearers need not remain such. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break the spell of infatuation that holds men absorbed in worldly things and to awaken a desire for the imperishable treasure. It is by resisting the Spirit that men become inattentive to or neglectful of God's Word. 
they are themselves responsible for the hardness of heart that prevents the good seed from taking root and for the evil growths that check its development. The garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance for sin. Poisonous, satanic plants must be uprooted. The soil once overgrown by thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor. So the evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. The Lord bids us by his prophet, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Jeremiah 4.3 and Hosea 10 verse 12. This work he desires to accomplish for us, and he asks us to cooperate with him. The sowers of the seed have a work to do in preparing hearts to receive the gospel. In the ministry of the word, there is too much sermonizing and too little of real heart-to-heart -heart work. There is need of personal labor for the souls of the lost. In Christ-like sympathy, we should come close to men individually and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of eternal life. Their hearts may be as hard as the beaten highway, and apparently it may be a useless effort to present the Savior to them. But while logic may fail to move and argument be powerless to convince, the love of Christ, revealed in personal ministry, may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root. So the sowers have something to do that the seed may not be choked with thorns or perish because of shallowness of soil. At the very outset of the Christian life, every believer should be taught its foundation principles. He should be taught that he is not merely to be saved by Christ's sacrifice, but that he is to make the life of Christ his life and the character of Christ his character. Let all be taught that they are to bear burdens and to deny natural inclination. Let them learn the blessedness of working for Christ, following him in self-denial and enduring hardness as good soldiers. Let them learn to trust his love and to cast on him their cares. Let them taste the joy of winning souls for him. In their love and interest for the lost, they will lose sight of self. The pleasures of the world will lose their power to attract and its burdens to dishearten. The plowshares of truth will do its work. It will break up the fallow ground. It will not merely cut off the tops of the thorns, but will take them out by the roots. In Good Ground The sower is not always to meet with disappointment. Of the seed that fell into good ground, the Savior said, This is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth, some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. The honest and good heart of which the parable speaks is not a heart without sin, for the gospel is to be preached to the lost. Christ said, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, Mark 2.17. He has an honest heart who yields to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He confesses his guilt and feels his need of the mercy and love of God. He has a sincere desire to know the truth that he may obey it. The good heart is a believing heart, one that has faith in the word of God. Without faith, it is impossible to receive the word. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. This is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. The Pharisees of Christ's day closed their eyes lest they should see and their ears lest they should hear. Therefore the truth could not reach their hearts. They were to suffer retribution for their willful ignorance and self-imposed blindness. But Christ taught his disciples that they were to open their minds to instruction and be ready to believe. He pronounced a blessing upon them because they saw and heard with eyes and ears that believed. The good ground hearer receives the word not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Only he who receives the scriptures as the voice of God speaking to himself is a true learner. 
He trembles at the word, for to him it is a living reality. He opens his understanding and his heart to receive it. Such hearers were Cornelius and his friends, who said to the apostle Peter, Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Acts 10.33 A knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose, the simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith. To those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance, angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of the truth. The good ground hearers, having heard the word, keep it. Satan, with all his agencies of evil, is not able to catch it away. Merely to hear or to read the word is not enough. He who desires to be profited by the Scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him. By earnest attention and prayerful thought, he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of the holy oracles. God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. He desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy, to study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption. Then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth, higher, holier, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communion with God through the study of the Scriptures. And bring forth fruit. Those who, having heard the word, keep it, will bring forth fruit in obedience. The word of God received into the soul will be manifest in good works. Its results will be seen in a Christ-like character and life. Christ said of himself, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 5, verse 30. And the scripture says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. 1 John 2, verse 6. The word of God often comes in collision with man's hereditary and cultivated traits of character and his habits of life. But the good ground hearer in receiving the word accepts all its conditions and requirements. His habits, customs, and practices are brought into submission to God's word. In his view, the commands of finite, erring man sink into insignificance beside the word of the infinite God. With the whole heart, with undivided purpose, he is seeking the life eternal, and at the cost of loss, persecution, or death itself, he will obey the truth. And he brings forth fruit with patience. None who receive God's word are exempt from difficulty and trial. But when affliction comes, the true Christian does not become restless, distrustful, or despondent. Though we cannot see the definite outcome of affairs or discern the purpose of God's providences, we are not to cast away our confidence. Remembering the tender mercies of the Lord, we should cast our care upon Him and with patience wait for His salvation. Through conflict, the spiritual life is strengthened. Trials well borne will develop steadfastness of character and precious spiritual graces. The perfect fruit of faith, meekness, and love often matures best amid storm clouds and darkness. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. James 5, verse 7. So the Christian is to wait with patience for the fruition in his life of the word of God. Often when we pray for the graces of the Spirit, God works to answer our prayers by placing us in circumstances to develop these fruits. But we do not understand his purpose, and wonder, and are dismayed. Yet none can develop these graces except through the process of growth and fruit-bearing. Our part is to receive God's word and to hold it fast, yielding ourselves fully to its control, and its purpose in us will be accomplished. If a man love me, Christ said, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John fourteen twenty three. 
The spell of a stronger, a perfect mind will be over us, for we have a living connection with the source of all enduring strength. In our divine life, we shall be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. We shall no longer live the common life of selfishness, but Christ will live in us. His character will be reproduced in our nature. Thus shall we bring forth the fruits of the Holy Spirit, some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred.